Welcome, everyone. I'm Laurel Fletcher. I am the co-faculty director of the Miller Institute for Global Challenges and the Law. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event with Philippe Sanz. Welcome back, Philippe, to Berkeley, um, who is going to be talking to us about Ecoside. I wanted to thank our co-sponsors for today's event, the Berkeley Journal of International Law, the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment, Ecologi Ecology Law Quarterly, the Human Rights Center, uh, and the International Human Rights Law Clinic have all joined with the Miller Institute to sponsor today's event. I'm going to briefly introduce our speaker, and then we're going to, I'm going to turn it over to him for his presentation, and then we're going to have lots of time for Q&A, so, um, uh, so get ready. So let me get the formal stuff out of the way. Philippe's a smart guy. Um, he is currently a professor of law at the University College of London. Um, he is also um, a product of Cambridge for both degrees, so, you know, a smarty pants. Um, other people think so too, not just us. He's a visiting professor at Harvard currently. He's visited at the University of Toronto and the University of Paris. Also has had academic positions at SOAS, University of Cambridge, NYU. You get the idea. Um, he is one of the most prominent international lawyers and intellectuals and public intellectuals of his age. And he works at the intersection of multiple disciplines. Today, he is really here to talk to us about the intersection of two of his primary di disciplines, looking at environmental law and looking at crimes of war. So what does he bring from his background that bring these two together? On the environmental side, um, in the early 1990s, um, Professor Sands was part of a group that launched the Center for International Environmental Law that had the aim of pushing the equitable development of international environmental law. And I want you to pay attention to that notion of equity, which drives, is a through line through all of his work. Following that, he began work on climate change with the Alliance of Small Island States to propose an alternative progressive vision for a climate change treaty in advance of the 1992 International Rio Earth Summit. Following the human and environmental impacts of state war-making infrastructures, Sands saw an opportunity to press for change on the international level after France resumed nuclear testing weapons in the South Pacific. I don't know if many of you here, I remember that time when people thought somehow it was okay to set off nuclear tests in the South Pacific because somehow that was uninhabited except for the people on those islands and the oceans that then sustained the rest of us. Philippe was thinking about that and he represented the Solomon Islands before the International Court of Justice seeking an advisory opinion on the legality of the use of nuclear weapons. And he developed a series of, of arguments that pushed the international, um, sorry, that push, pushed the world court to embrace a more pro-environmental perspective and recognized that this was a legitimate uh, environmental projection is a legitimate subject of international law. So fast forward to June of 2021 when um, he co-chaired and finished with a drafting panel to release a proposed definition for the crime of ecocide, which gives this movement, which has preceded that effort uh, by decades, legal legitimacy. So it's now being elevated into a proposal that can be discussed, debated, and, and taken up. So that's the environmental aspect. Also, I want to draw on his line of work that derives and is informed by, rooted in his work on war and uh, accountability for war atrocities. And I'll start with Ukraine because we're all familiar with it. Lviv is a city that we hear a lot about these days because it also serves as the base for humanitarian operations in Ukraine. It's also the site for Professor Sand's book, East West Street that tells the story of the development of the two modern international crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, 
through the stories of two men who championed them, Hirsch Lauterpacht and Raphael Lemkin. If you haven't read it, you should. It is genre-breaking and path-breaking. It cracks open what can often be an impenetrable, impenetrable thicket of international jurisprudence and makes it living and breathing and accessible to a popular audience and scholars alike. You'll hear more about um, Professor Sen's involvement um, in, uh, in addressing the crimes that are happening in Ukraine in, the, in his remarks and in Q&A. I also want to note that Philippe's um, work is always rooted in a perspective of communities and, and with uh, those who are victims, not perpetrators, of international crimes. And there's a through line in, in, uh, in his work on behalf of Human Rights Watch against Pinochet before the British House of Lords. Um, there's a through line to representing Guantanamo detainees and earning the release of a UK um, citizen who was held in the facility. And from that, Philippe's curiosity about how is it that uh, political leaders can subvert the rule of law led him to a path-breaking book, The Torture Team, which uh, my co-author, Professor Stover, and I relied on when we did our own work later on um, studying Guantanamo detainees. And in that book, Philippe really traced for us the role of top American officials and the roles that they played in systematizing torture. And that pushed back against the then dominant narrative that the uh, violations and stories, which they were called, of torture were the result of a few bad apples and not the, the logical consequence and, in fact, intention of a policy of torture. So to bring us to today, this incredible history um, that Professor Sands has traced and occupied and written is now coming home to roost. And we th if we think about how audacious we thought that a, something called a crime against humanity or a genocide crime was in 19... 48, we can trace that these ideas are, are audacious until they seem inevitable and then obvious, and we wondered why it took us so long to codify them. Um, ecocide will be one of those crimes, and as Professor Sands had said, this is a moment, and you want to be on the right side of history. So today, you're going to be able to tell your children and grandchildren when we're talking about the crime of ecocide, that you heard it here first. With that, please welcome Professor Sands. Thank you so much, uh, Laurel, for a very generous uh, introduction and for all the work that you and your colleagues and students do here uh, at Berkeley. I know the school a little. And in fact, you remind me that my start in what became my involvement in international environmental law, actually starts um, here um, in San Francisco, Oakland, California, back in 1989, when I and a British friend of mine, James Cameron, were invited to meet a couple of lawyers from the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund here this is in San Francisco. And from that grew the Center for International Environmental Law that you mentioned. When we agreed the topic that we would talk about today, several months ago, I knew I was coming through and uh, wanted to have a chance to meet the students and faculty and others to talk a little bit about these things. Of course, we didn't know about Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine was not about to explode. Russia was not about to invade. Um, the United States president was not about to call the president of Russia a war criminal, and as you know, um, 24 hours ago, he made the allegation that what is happening in Ukraine is capable of being characterized as a genocide. And we'll talk a little bit about that in due course. And uh, one of the ironies, of course, I'll say a little bit more about it in a moment, is that the origins of these international crimes are in a sense of their legal characterization, situated in what is today the territory of Ukraine. So there is a particular resonance and a particular connection. But, but I think to look 
at the subject of ecocide and its relationship to genocide, you've got to hit the pause button and go back to how the world was before 1945. People assume that these concepts, crimes against humanity, genocide, have existed since time immemorial. They haven't. When the Second World War started in 1939, there was really only one international crime on the statute books, and that was what we call today war crimes, international humanitarian law. And rules that emerged in the beginning part of the 19th century to limit methods and means of warfare. And, and that is the origin of modern international criminal law, actually with a very strong connection to Russia, famous declaration of St. Petersburg on you know, expanding bullets and the prohibition on their use for protection of uh, civilians. But by 1939, um, there was really no such thing as international criminal law. There were meetings about new international conventions to deal with piracy and slavery and, as they called it, uh, and various other things. But it was pretty much a blank slate. And then the Second World War came along. And out of the Second World War came, in January 1942, a meeting in London which produced something called the Declaration of St. James. And the Declaration of St. James was promulgated by about a dozen governments in exile that had left uh, occupied Europe, which was under German Nazi rule, gathered in London and issued a statement that when the war was over, they would punish Nazi war criminals for what had happened. That moved along, one thing led to another, and at Yalta in February 1942, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin committed to create an international military tribunal. And that international military tribunal is what we know as the famous Nuremberg trial the original Nuremberg trial at an international level, not the subsequent Nuremberg trials, which were US military trials, but held in the same room. June 45, the four allied powers, Britain, France, United States, Soviet Union, gathered in London and drafted the statute for the International Military Tribunal that would sit in the famous courtroom 600 in Nuremberg. But they had a problem because they only had really one existing international crime, and that was war crimes, and they wanted to go beyond. And basically what they did was they invented three new crimes, which made their way into either Article 6 of the Statute of Nuremberg or the indictment. The two that made it into the Statute of Nuremberg were crimes against peace, waging a manifestly illegal war. Today it's the crime of aggression. I might say a little bit more about that later in relation to Nuremberg, uh, to Ukraine. And the second new crime was crimes against humanity, the destruction of civilians on a systematic, widespread, extensive basis. Into the Nuremberg indictment came the crime of genocide, although in 1945, it was included as a subcategory of war crimes, not as a freestanding new international crime like it is today. So uh, I've often thought about the defendant sitting in the dock uh, when the trial opened on the 20th of November, 1945. Many of them were lawyers, and many of them were highly educated, highly intelligent lawyers. And they must have really wondered about this uh, indictment uh, that had been laid against them and these three new international crimes, which very frankly did not exist uh, when the war began on the 1st of September 1939. They were new inventions effectively applied retroactively. I had my class this week with my students at Harvard on, on that moment, and um, we went over the list of crimes and the basic uh, provisions that have been adopted. And you can't find in uh, pre-September 39 the existence of those crimes. So Nuremberg becomes an absolutely crucial moment. 
in modern international law because, and it is a revolutionary moment. It's the moment at which the international community decides a number of things. It decides that the sovereignty of the state is not absolute. There are limits. It decides that individuals have rights under international law protected in times of conflict. It decides that groups have rights and are protected under international law in times of conflict. And it sets the path for the way forward. The way forward includes the Tokyo trials, which begin a year or so after Nuremberg, and a path is then developed beginning in the 1940s to inscribe in international law the idea of using the criminal law at the international level to achieve certain social objectives. But it's a new idea, and that's a really significant point. This does not have a long-lasting history. If we're going to talk about ecocide, you've got to understand that it is a, a, an idea that emerges in an early stage of the development of the international legal order. When I was a young academic, I was a research fellow at Cambridge, and I, one of my colleagues at St. Catherine's College Cambridge was the Professor of English Legal History, John Baker, and he'd uh, once a month or so invite me for lunch and want to know what I was working on and what I was doing, and I'd say, oh, you know, some aspect of international law, and he'd and he'd say, ah, yes, we had a similar problem in English law in 1472, and it took 272 years to sort out the problem. <laughs> That's how I think you have to think about international law. You cannot expect these rules to be adopted at a moment in 1945, and then all of a sudden, governments, presidents, prime ministers, sovereigns, emperors are just going to keel over and suddenly start complying with these new rules. It is a long, long game, and we are at a very, very early stage today. So that was the context of what happened in 1945. Laurel kindly and generously mentioned my book, East West Street. In 2010, I received an invitation to give a lecture on the cases that I have done before various international and national courts on crimes against humanity and genocide. Crimes against humanity is essentially about the protection of individuals, genocide is about the protection of groups. Two ideas juxtaposed in international law since 1945, two very modern recent developments. I knew basically that these things uh, had um, emerged as recently as 1945, but I knew nothing about the history of the emergence of the two ideas. And the invitation from the city of Lviv, which I had never heard of, when I got it, and most of you have probably never heard of Lviv until a few weeks ago. I didn't know where it was until I was told that it's the same place as Lemberg from the time of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Lvov from the short-lived time when the city was part of Poland. Lemberg was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire for about 172 years until 1918. It then became part of Poland uh, in, as part of the Treaty of Versailles settlement, Lwów, and then in 1939, it ceased to be part of Poland. The Germans occupied, um, and for two years, sorry, the Soviets occupied, it became Lwów, and then the Germans occupied uh, in 1941 in July, and it became again Lemberg, and then in 1944, the um, Germans were thrown out by the Red Army, and once again, it became Lvov, Lviv. Uh, and Lviv, once Ukraine emerged as a sort of semi-independent state after the settlement of 1945, after Yalta, is the name that it has had. It's a city which has seen a great deal of bloodshed. It's a city which is contested. Um, my favorite anecdote in relation to the city of Lviv is uh, the month of November 1918, when it changed hands four times in the space of a single month. In the first week, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the second week, um, it was part of um, the short-lived Western European, Western Ukrainian uh, Republic, 
the third week, it was again Austro-Hungarian Empire. In the fourth week, um, it was Poland. And I've often wondered what the teacher of criminal law, Professor Julius Makarevich, did with each change. What would we do if we were part of a town that changed, city that changed um, a sovereign every week? Do we just change what we teach? Do we just carry on teaching the same subject? I don't know. Anyway. The reason that I went to Lviv was that my grandfather was born in Lemberg in 1904, and I thought it would be really interesting to go um, and see it. And I spent the summer of 2010 doing a bit of research on what had happened in that city, the history of the city, and I stumbled across, and take no credit for it, some sort of brilliant discovery or anything, because it was completely accidental, the um, remark two remarkable facts. Remarkable fact number one was that the man who put the concept of crimes against humanity into international law, and we can date it very, very precisely to the 29th of July, 1945, because it's the moment when Hirsch Lauterpacht, professor of international law at Cambridge, had tea in his garden at number six Cranmer Road in Cambridge with Robert Jackson, the US chief prosecutor for the Nuremberg trial. He said, put crimes against humanity into the statute. That is literally what happened. And it took off. And amazingly, Hirsch Lauterpacht, who was actually the father of my mentor in my student days, to which he referred, Elie Lauterpacht, as some of you uh, may recall, and sadly no longer with us, um, Hirsch Lauterpacht, amazingly, was a student at the University of Lviv from 1915 to 1919. So I thought, how remarkable. I'll turn up in Lviv and link the origins uh, of crimes against humanity to not only the city, but to the very law faculty in which I'd been invited to give a lecture. And then I discovered that the man who in literally invented the concept of genocide in November 1944 in his book, Axis Rule, Raphael Lemkin, whose name is much more widely known than that of Lauterpacht, focused, unlike Lem Lauterpacht, who was concerned about the protection of individuals, Lemkin was focused on the protection of groups. And unbelievably, from 1921 to 1926, he too was a student at the University of Lviv. You literally couldn't invent it. So I arrive in Lviv in October 2010, bringing the delightful news that Lviv is the origin of modern international criminal law. And ever since, um, that uh, has been a resonant and powerful issue, not only in Lviv, but also in the whole of Ukraine. To the point, uh, you'll see where I'm going with all of this in drawing the strands together, to the point that literally pretty much every lawyer in Ukraine is aware of East West Street, the book in which I wrote all of these things, including the current foreign minister, Dimitro Kuleba, who a day after I wrote an op-ed in the Financial Times on the 27th of February about Ukraine and international law, got in touch and said, I need your assistance because modern international criminal law is where Ukraine started and we are going to use it in this conflict. And just to pause for a moment and we'll come back to this, I do not know of an another conflict in the time I have been conscious and active as an academic and as a practitioner in which international law has played a role from day one. And I think part of the reason for that is the connection with the origins of these concepts, with the place in which the horrors that we're seeing today are uh, occurring. I think that plays a very important role. And the second important role is that many of the players, including President Zelensky himself, are surrounded by people who really know these origins and really know these rules. So, You'll see where I'm coming to uh, and why I'm uh, sharing that history with you. One of the important aspects about the four international crimes that were effectively put on our statute books in 1945 and have been the only international crimes ever since is that they are inherently anthropocentric. They focus, very understandably, on the protection and well-being of the human. There are, in the rules on methods and means of warfare, rules like you can't use the environment as an instrument of warfare, but you won't find any 
rules of international criminal law which seek to protect the environment as such. And I think in the context of the moment of 1945, that is not a critique, that is perfectly understandable. There was no such thing as international environmental law in 1945. There was no such thing as international environmental law when I studied international law for the first time, which was in 1982. Um, it just didn't exist as a concept. So the idea of using international criminal law to protect the environment could not have existed at that moment because of the nature of the direction in which international legal rules are constructed. What happened after 1945? Basically for 50 years, not a lot. You had the Geneva Conventions of 1949, the Protocols of 1977, and efforts in the UN International Law Commission to take forward the idea of international criminal law to protect humans in times of conflict and in times of peace, Lemkin's idea. You had the first multilateral human rights treaty, which is 1948, Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, which introduced a whole raft of other treaties essentially based on the approach. But genocide was the beginnings, in a sense, after the UN Charter of modern international human rights law, and there's a connection between the two. But until the mid-1990s, before international courts and tribunals, there was no international criminal law until the collapse of Yugoslavia and Rwanda. And the Security Council, pushed largely by the Clinton administration, proposed in uh, 93 and 94, respectively, the creation of two new international criminal tribunals, one for Yugoslavia, one for Rwanda. They would have jurisdiction in relation to three international crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide, taking the definitions for the first and the third that existed in international law, for crimes against humanity, there was a bit of progressive development of the law laying out what the crimes were. And of course, the fact that you now had two international criminal tribunals then catalyzed the negotiations for the creation of an international criminal court, which were completed after literally, I kid you not, 50 years. Started in 1948, um, completed in 1998 uh, with the adoption of the statute of the International Criminal Court in Rome. Uh, and those rules are the ones <laughs> and those rules are the ones we've lived with ever since. That is the existing system of international criminal law for international crimes. In parallel with that begins, really only in 1972, what becomes modern international environmental law, starting at a conference held in Stockholm, the UN Conference on the Human Environment. You won't find the environment referred to in the United Nations Charter. Um, it, it really only begins to be a subject for UN action and for global and regional action in the 1970s. And it moves forward progressively, and there is a great leap forward in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, uh, the Montreal Protocol, the ozone layer, became one of the crucial catalyzers. And the second crucial catalyzer, ironically enough, because it's been in use again, was the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant on the 26th of April, 1986. And it actually coincidentally became the catalyst for my involvement in international environmental law. An outfit in Washington, the Annenberg Communications Program, asked me to do a paper on transboundary pollution in the context of Chernobyl. And I discovered as a very young academic, there are no rules. There's nothing out there. And that prompted a huge series of developments in the years that followed to ratchet up the rules for the protection of the regional environment, the global environment, and national environment. So that by the first part of the 21st century, you've got a big body of rules on the protection of the environment, although very little that criminalizes. And there's a few conventions, 
Basel Convention on Transboundary Movements of Hazardous Waste, which criminalizes at the domestic level dumping hazardous waste in the global south, for example. But you don't have a move towards the criminalization of actions by individuals under international criminal law. Curiously, at that 1972 conference on the human environment, the Prime Minister of Sweden, Olaf Palmer, who makes the introductory speech, says in his introductory speech, one day there will be a crime under international law alongside the four other crimes, which will be the crime of ecocide. He has drawn his ideas from the work of an American sociologist in 1969 who is um, deeply unhappy about the use of napalm, Agent Orange, in Vietnam, and has started raising questions about whether one should use the force of the criminal law at the international level to achieve protections not only of human beings, but of, of the environment. And, and the debate begins between 69 and 72, but it's, it's very, very early. Governments have no appetite for this. It carries on through in the 1980s. One of the very important players in 1986 was a man called Ben Whitaker, British actually parliamentarian, who becomes the UN Special Rapporteur on um, genocide, and he uh, pushes also ideas on uh, ecocide, and the issue is slowly beginning to come up uh, the agenda until about 15 years ago, a British barrister called Polly Higgins decides to make it her life's work. And at this point, she starts gathering people from around the world to start focusing on the idea that existing international criminal law is too anthropocentric and it needs to start taking account of developments in the protection of the environment through international law and use the force of the criminal law at the international level to achieve protections of the environment, a more ecocentric approach. She um, has in her mind either a global treaty on ecocide, she calls it ecocide, um, and, uh, or an amendment to the statute of the International Criminal Court, which would be a much easier thing to achieve, she suspects, and I think uh, she is right. Now, just pause for a moment. Um, she works with a group of individuals who create a non-governmental organization called the Stop Ecocide Foundation. And they then globalize. There's a chapter here in California, there are many chapters around the United States, there are chapters absolutely all over the world, and they have made it their mission to make international criminal law more ecocentric in the context of the situation that we currently face. One of the points that I'm making here is that just as Hirsch Lauterpacht in the speech that he wrote for Hartley Shawcross, mm -hmm. the British prosecutor at Nuremberg, included in his speech a line to the effect that um, abstract entities don't kill people, human beings kill people. Abstract entities don't commit international crimes. Humans commit international crimes. Abstract entities don't push these ideas. Just as genocide and crimes against humanity were essentially the consequence of interventions by a small number of individuals led by Lauterpacht and Lemkin, so it is with ecocide. It has been pushed not by governments, but by a small number of individuals. In October 2020, I was contacted by the Stop Ecoside Foundation. They'd been given a grant by um, a Swedish foundation to put together a working group of 12 people to look at the possibility of elaborating a definition of a new crime of ecocide which could be integrated into the Rome Statute, the fifth crime that began to be called. I was contacted because I'm one of the rare people who has done international environmental law, as Laurel generously explained, but also has spent some time on international criminal law, and they wanted someone who was a sort of establishment type of figure, 
who could help governments be persuaded that this could be done. I agreed uh, to do it, um, in large part prompted by younger generations, including my own children, um, and co-chaired the group with a wonderful Senegalese um, uh, lawyer who had been an international prosecutor, uh, Dior Fal Salo. Um, and she and I worked together very closely with 10 other members of a working group. It was incredibly, I was very keen that it be a very diverse group. Um, and it was diverse, you know, to take um, the, the, the German green sort of ideas. Um, there were the fundies, the absolute diehard activists who basically wanted a whole raft of things to be characterized as the crime of ecocide. And there were the realists, uh, those who wanted to ratchet down the definition to give it some prospect of being taken forward. And we worked on it for eight months. We would meet once a month for three hours by Zoom with a series of papers presented. We, um, cons we were keen to have a public consultation, which we did you know, uh, on the web and very publicly, and got hundreds of uh, comments in on what the crime of ecocide should be. And there was a whole raft of uh, proposals. I, I was very keen with Dior that we should try to reach a consensus. Um, we all know that when you produce a report, it's going to have longer and faster and more useful legs if there aren't, if there isn't a dissenting report. Uh, and, and it was, a, you know, it was a really interesting exercise to get a group of twelve people from a range of different backgrounds. You know, at one end of the spectrum, a hard-headed former U.S. federal prosecutor, to at the other end. Uh, folks who've been involved on the ground with oil spills, dealing with Chevron in Ecuador. And I think that's what gave the whole project a legitimacy, but raised, of course, certain challenges. In coming up with the definition, which I'll come to in a moment, um, we were very much committed by the end to adopting an approach recognizing that the international legal order is hugely conservative to base the language and the approach that we took on precedence in other parts of international criminal law to the extent possible. For anyone in this room who's worked with governments in international negotiations, you will recognize the moment um, when you are asked by a government, has this ever been done before? Has this word ever been used before? If you say no, it's going to be much more difficult to push it along. But if you can point to a provision of the Geneva Conventions or the additional protocol or the Genocide Convention and say, yes, here, look, it's the same word, except we're just taking the same idea and we're applying it in a different way, then people will go, okay, that's something that we can live with. And so every word of our definition is drawn in some way from a, an existing international uh, convention in the field of the environment, in the field of international criminal law. That was um, extremely uh, important. Our terms of reference were to come up with a proposal to amend the statute of Rome, the ICC statute. So one of the critiques of our proposal is we don't deal with corporations. That's right, because we were not asked to deal with corporations. We were asked to deal with the criminal responsibility under international law of individuals. Pause for a moment. I'm actually not very interested in putting criminal responsibility on corporations, why you can't lock corporations up. You can fine them, and corporations actually don't give a toss about being fined. They just pay the money, and they carry on. Nothing concentrates the mind more than the prospect of a tap on the shoulder and the possibility that you may face a deprivation of liberty. We know that to be the case. I once did an advice for a tobacco company large tobacco company on whether it could be a crime against humanity to um, sell your products on the basis of unshared knowledge about what the human health impacts could be. And my conclusion was yes, and it really concentrates minds when you say, actually, you know, one day there may well be an investigation about whether this or this practice 
and for you know, executives of large corporations, that concentrates the mind, I can tell you, a whole lot more than the idea that their corporation may get a fine or a reprimand in the press. So the focus was on individuals. We based ourselves on existing precedents, and the definition that we came up with is as follows. For the purpose of this statute, ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. I'll just unpack a little bit of that, just to, and then in questions and conversation we can talk a little bit more because you'll have your own um, questions and your own comments. Firstly, why the term ecocide? And this is really interesting. Um, I asked right at the beginning when they first approached me, why, why do you have to call it ecocide? Because the problem with ecocide is it inscribes itself into a relationship with the concept of genocide. And as some of you will know in the room, proving a genocide is a very, very difficult thing. It's not half as difficult to prove a crime against humanity. Basically, if you kill 100,000 people or 10,000 people or 400 people in butcher, it's going to be a crime against humanity. Is it a genocide? I'm sure President Biden will not have turned his mind to the particularities of the international laws on genocide, but what you have to prove is the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. And that's not an easy thing to prove in circumstances in which people tend not to leave bits of paper lying around saying, I'm going to kill these people in order to destroy the group in whole or in part. And so the practice has emerged before the ICTY and the ICTR and the International Court of Justice to allow judges to infer from a pattern of behavior that special genocidal intent. But it's a difficult thing to infer. And the judges, wrongly, I believe, have put the bar very, very high. And at paragraph 148 of the most recent judgment of the International Court on the matter, in which I had tried to lower the bar and failed, the majority of the court said to infer a genocidal intent from a pattern of behavior, it has to be the only reasonable inference from the pattern of behavior. And I think that is a threshold that is more or less impossible to prove. The point is, ecocide sort of puts the concept into the same basket as genocide. So I said to them very early on, the promoters of this idea, why don't you call it an environmental crime against humanity or some such thing? And that was really interesting. They'd gone out and done market research. They'd gone and done opinion polls. You know, 20,000 people around the world and you know, going up to people in the street and say, what do you think about environmental crimes against humanity? And people's eyes would glaze over <laughs> and they'd, you know, what's that? And crimes against humanity has a sort of technical aspect. But the moment they referred to the word ecocide, everyone was saying, oh, yes, we're completely against that. That's terrible. We want to protect the environment. It's awful. They knew exactly what it meant. And there is some magic about the word genocide, which is, of course, why precisely President Zelensky on the 9th of March for the first time said, this is genocide. Because when you use the G word, it's on the front page of every single newspaper the next day, which is what happened this week when President Biden used the G word. It was on the front page of literally every newspaper in the world. I wake up the next morning and I've got literally 140 emails from around the world saying, <laughs> is he right? Is it a genocide? What does it mean? If he had said, it's a crime against humanity, there would have been zero attention to it. And he knew that. And Zelensky knew that. And the folks who are promoting the idea of ecocide know that. So what we've done with this definition is effectively take, you know, the, the, the outer characteristics of genocide, the word, but the entrails are much more akin to crime against humanity. We don't have that need to prove the intent to destroy the environment in whole or in part, because obviously you could never prove that someone has an intention to destroy 
the environment in Holland Park because that's not how it works. People engage in an activity and then the unintended consequence is harm to the environment. So it has to go into a war crimes or crimes against humanity um, type of approach. We wanted to set a double threshold because we did not want it to include just any old um, environmental harmful act. So the act has to be either unlawful or wanton. Unlawful under national or international law, very little under international law. Under national law, there's quite a lot, but of course, a state is then just free to make lawful that which is horrible, and it's off the hook in terms of our definition of ecocide. And so to deal with that eventuality, we had a, an alternative, which is um, wanton. And a wanton act. And the reason we took wanton, and it's been criticized, and I recognize that criticism, is that the definition we put of wanton, which is drawn from the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and 1977, and tweak, wanton means with reckless disregard for damage which would be clearly excessive in relation to the social and economic benefits anticipated. In other words, there's a sort of cost-benefit analysis and that has been critiqued by the purists and I understand that critique but there's another factor that we had to think about and it was this the world is lopsided some countries have industrialized and economically developed more than others I personally and the majority of the group were against a situation in which you applied a level playing field there could be certain acts which could occur in one country which would be an ecocide, but which in another country would not be an ecocide. Personally, I'm attracted to that idea because if you look at the membership of the International Criminal Court, the vast number of members are from the Global South. And if you don't put in a provision like that, you're going to get the reaction more colonial. You're getting us to adopt rules which are going to stop us from following the developmental path that you followed. So you need something in the definition that meets that challenge. But I recognize the critique that it introduces a strongly anthropocentric mode. It may be there's a way around that. We could not, in the six months available to us, find a way um, around um, that uh, difficulty. We can come back in our conversation, because I'll stop now so that we can have some questions and discussion. We put in definitions of the environment. We put in definitions of severe harm, widespread, and so on and so forth, and we can come back all to that. Let me end with one final aspect, and it is this. We had a tremendous debate in the group about whether to include lists of acts, or a list of acts, that would be ecocidal, so to speak. A and there were two views. One view was, without a list, it lacks credibility. The other view is that once you put a list in, the project is dead. Why? I don't think in 2021 you can have a list of ecocidal acts and not say something about climate change. The moment you put the words climate change into the definition, it's dead. I know from bitter experience of having negotiated some of the climate change conventions in 92 and 97, the idea having failed to regulate climate change or deal with it effectively by international legislation over now more than 30 years, that along comes an international criminal law that is suddenly going to criminalize all sorts of things in association with climate change is a nonsense. It's just not going to happen. And the moment you put climate change in there, countries will just back away. You have to leave it to the prosecutors and the judges to elaborate. Second thing that was very important for me, and this comes out of my experience with genocide, we know that every act of legislation has unintended consequences. Every single act. And that applies to at the international level. In the definition of genocide, as many of you will know, there is a list of groups. Who are protected? National groups, ethnic groups, racial groups, religious groups. That's the four categories. No other group is protected. And the effect of that has been to lead to a system where all other groups are unprotected. Sexual orientation, political 
sociable. They're not protected. If you do nasty things to them, it might be a crime against humanity, it might be a war crime, but it's never going to be genocide. And this is a major problem because it has created a hierarchy of group identity, which is why one of the critiques of genocide to which I am very uh, partial is that genocide as a concept has had unintended consequences. It has, I think, given rise to the very conditions that give rise to genocide. It has reinforced the sense and the protections of group identity in international law, which I know from bitter experience in Yugoslavia has reinforced and created greater hatreds. In other words, I think there is a critique that the concept of genocide, which was intended to prevent genocide, will probably end up causing even more genocide than it prevents. A and that is a serious consideration. So to cut to the chase, for me, this project on ecocide was the beginnings of changing consciousness, to move international criminal law away from a purely anthropocentric enterprise, a purely anthropocentric project, to one which will begin to put on the agenda the protection of the environment as an end in itself. And in that, I and many others who worked on this are deeply inspired by a single law review article, which is to this day the best law review article I've ever read by Christopher Stone. Many of you will know it, should trees have standing. In other words, giving to non-human objects rights under the international legal order. And that's essentially what this is a shift towards. To conclude, um, what will happen next? There will be an effort to amend the Statute of Rome, and I think over time it will be successful. We were very surprised a week after we adopted our definition, the Secretary General of the United Nations said publicly, this is a definition we can work with, this should be the basis for a negotiation to amend the Statute of Rome, and a number of countries are now beginning to push for it. The one that's gone furthest is Belgium, which now has a domestic law committing to the implementation of a, a, a resolution, sorry, passed by Parliament, its federal Parliament, pushing for the implementation of this standard into domestic law and international law. I don't for a moment think this is the final word. It's a basis for negotiations. It's a basis for discussion. There are many critiques to be made of this definition, but the project is basically about changing consciousness. Will it happen soon? I thought it was beginning to happen, but then came Ukraine. And Ukraine has, and will, I think for many years, suck the energy out of various other projects. All of the existing international crimes, the four, are on the agenda right now in terms of dealing with that situation. And I think for the next year or two, a huge amount of effort is going to go into what is happening, how you deal with the Ukraine situation. And I think that the appetite for governments to put effort into um, a new initiative whilst dealing with the reinforcement of existing international crimes, I suspect the appetite for that will be very limited, but I think a lot of people are going to give it a go. Let me stop there and let's uh, throw it open to conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. That was wonderful. Um, let me let me start with the first. I, I have so many questions, so um, I want to go in several different directions. But I want to have a follow up on the climate change and ecocide because mm. I think um, that's close to everyone's heart here, and and then um, and then a question on Ukraine. Um, so. You say that, you know, quite explicitly, this is not going to, this is not a, cr uh, this is not a climate change crime, but you then say, move to say there are unintended consequences. So, which leads me to think that you have some theory of a relationship between raising consciousness around ecocide and the and socializing the concept of individual criminal accountability for wanton acts of environmental destruction. 
And as we know, climate change, when I think about wanton acts of destruction, and we are going to be living in those consequences, um, and some are already, what do you think of the possibilities it beyond, if any, just the association and, and raising, uh, you know, conscientious, conscientization about climate change, individual responsibility of political leaders and environmental yeah, leaders? Let, 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 let me come straight to that. Um, so one of the things that really did surprise me immediately after we put out, or the Stop Ecoside Foundation put out, the little paper, which I, can, I think you've got and which you can put on the website and so that it's available to everyone, was a huge number of interview requests from members of the panel. And they came from not the usual suspects. It was really interesting. Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Forbes. You know, ooh, there's something coming along the horizon that's going to cause a little bit of a difficulty for our readers. And my favorite conversation was with the journalist from the FT, a fabulous journalist. It's actually a wonderful newspaper. Um, who pushed me and pushed me and pushed me to um, give examples. And I've resisted giving examples for a, very, for a very simple and very strategic reason. The moment you name a person or a corporation or a country, you've got an opponent. And so I have never mentioned any individual, any country, any corporation, not because I don't believe there are individuals and countries and corporations, but because I don't want to be the one who creates opponents uh, to the extent that I'm going to be involved in this project going forward. So she said, well, can I name some folks? And I said, yeah, well, that's for you to do. And so who did she name? She named two people. And this was the FT. So it has, in a particular community, a resonance. Um, she named the president of Brazil, Mr. Bolsonaro, for his fine work on the Amazon. And she named then the chief executive officer of Exxon Mobil. Um, and uh, I understand from people that I know in that company that he was not well pleased um, <laughs> because he has children and you know he has a community that he's part of and no one wants to be an ecocideur. Um, so, Obviously, this project, it, 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 is a, it is potentially a climate change crime. The problem that we face is every one of us in the group of 12 contributes to climate change. Every one of you in this room contributes to climate change. So what, are we all climate change criminals um, to different degrees? And we ended up as a group concluding, I think wisely, that it was not for the group to determine where the line was crossed. At what point your act by reference to sort of the mens rea, your mental state in uh, engaging in the act and the effect of the act, it wasn't for us to determine where, that will be for judges to determine. But of course it's capable of being applied to the climate change consequence. And of course, in due course, it will be applied to the climate change consequence. But interestingly, one of the first areas in Britain where this came up was the ever brilliant British government of today chose the moment of COP26 to announce that it was going to authorize a new coal mine in the United Kingdom. I mean, could not invent it. And uh, of course, the immediate uh, response was, well, this is ecocide. I mean, the British government authorizing a new coal mine at the very moment that one part of government is telling the world you've got to reduce, you know, carbon emissions and do all these things and impose upon China and India non-use of coal, and it's authorizing its own coal mine. And in the public debate, ecocide cut in. And that's been happening in a number of places. So it, it is absolutely a crime which in principle, we'll deal with many elements of climate change and many other elements, but the group didn't think it was for it to say when the line is crossed. But I think you can also envisage a situation.
in which the authorization of certain activity in one country might achieve a different response in the ecocide context in the authorization of the same activity in another country. And, and, and this raises some fundamental issues. I mean, a genocide is a genocide wherever it occurs. Is an e should an ecocide be an ecocide wherever it occurs? And, and there is a good debate to be had about that. It, I think the answer is, if the answer to that question is yes, then I think the bar is going to get set so high as it has with genocide that it will not have a useful practical effect, even in concentrating the market. Very good. Let's um, open it up to questions from the audience. Yes, Ted. Uh, here, here's a oh. mic. So first of all, your book is fabulous, and East West Strait has, I just, I felt like I was entering a world, obviously, that you've been living in, and you just did a brilliant job. Um, I also want to say I was watching Adam Schiff introduce, I interview State Department lawyers yesterday asking if they could prove genocide. And I thought, but for your work, I'm not sure he would be asking that question. So I want to thank you. He has read the book. Yes, <laughs> yes, and has had you on the show. Um, my question is this. If we were to wind back to 1945, and we were going to be interviewing the advocates for the crimes of genocide and humanity, as, war, as international crimes, I would think there was a belief that making them criminal would reduce the number of such crimes. That it's not just about waiting till it's over and punishing, which obviously was a solution in 1942. When you watch what's happening now, and you can use Ukraine or other examples, has all of this good work actually reduced the incidence of war crimes or genocide? And is what the, na the international response to Russia now, is it more effective because of these legal systems? It's a hugely important question, and I don't know the answer. I'm often asked, can I identify a single act of mass atrocity that did not occur, that would have occurred, but did not occur, but for the emergence of all these rules. We don't know. I mean, what's fascinating to me about what's happening in Ukraine right now is that the law is being instrumentalized in a way that it is not in any other conflict. And it is having an effect. It is being used plainly and clearly to create notions of supporters and opponents. I mean, yesterday's exchanges were really fascinating on that front. You know, President Biden says, oh, it looks to me like it's genocide, and President Macron says, no, it doesn't, and Trudeau comes in and says, yes, it does. And what happens the next day, Zelensky fingers the French and said, you're not really supporting us, and the French feel really bad. And <laughs> so, so how these things function and what the effect of creating um, a solid grouping will be, well, we can speculate about. What I thought your question was going to go to was this question, which was the, the challenges faced back in 1944 and 45 by the proponents of these two crimes. And the challenges that Lemkin faced were monumental. I mean, it is an extraordinary story. You know the story. I mean, he was going around lobbying and dealing with media, which has a very important role in all of these things. And meeting a lot of objection from um, people that it was hopeless, it's never going to happen, states don't want this. I mean, my favorite account is in Samantha Power's book, Problem from Hell, where she describes the wonderful Benjamin Ferenc's account of meeting Raphael Lemkin and saying he was a total pain in the ass. Here we are trying to prosecute these terrible war crimes, and along comes Lemkin trying to persuade us that there's this other crime that we should be focusing on, and we're just trying to get on with our jobs. And that's sort of being replicated today in relation to ecocide, and also in relation to the crime of aggression. It's really interesting. But for the war, there would not have been any of these crimes. And a number of us are working to try to put the crime of aggression into the debate, and that's beginning to happen definitely beginning to happen. 
Well, there is a proposal to create now. Zelensky has proposed it, a special criminal tribunal for the crime of aggression in Ukraine. And an informal working group of Ukraine and five European countries now is working on a draft agreement, and that is beginning to move forward. And there will be a meeting on May the 6th in Lithuania, hosted by the Prime Minister of Lithuania, to push forward that idea. The three permanent members of the Security Council, who could play an interesting role in this, the United States, France, and the United Kingdom, are sitting on the fence. They're not for it. They're not against it. What's the concern? They don't say there's no crime of aggression. They keep on using the word aggression. They don't say you couldn't create a tribunal which delegates the law that exists in Ukraine to an internationalized instance to help Ukraine deal with it. No, their concern behind the scenes, and I'm talking to them and lots of other people are talking to them, is this. Whoa, if there's a special tribunal created now for Russia today, it'll be us tomorrow. It's the principle of exposure. And what's remarkable about, remarkable about the 1945 moment is that it didn't stop these concepts from taking off. And I think it'll be, it'll be the same with ecocide. And I think it's the job of the academics and of the media to go back to that 1945 moment and, and deal with the naysayers. I can't answer your main question, but I think the world is nevertheless a better place for these crimes. And let me just give one specific example. In November 1919, I did an event a bit like this at, um, at George Washington University, and my fellow panelist um, was uh, the former American judge at the International Court of Justice, Tom Bergenthal. And it was a month before the hearings were going to be held in the case under the Genocide Convention brought by the Gambia against Myanmar for the um, allegations of genocide perpetrated against the Rohingya community, Muslim Rohingya community. And I'm just to declare an interest, I'm, I'm counsel for Gambia in that case against Myanmar, so I'm, I'm not an independent observer. And at some point in the conversation with Tom Bergenthal, one of the things you need to know about Tom Bergenthal, who has written an extraordinary book about his life, it's called A Lucky Child. In 1944, age 10, Tom Bergenthal was in Auschwitz, and he was in the ch charge and the care of Joseph Mengele. He was one of Mengele's kids. And Tom said on the panel, can you imagine, Philippe, if in 1944, there had been a convention on the crime on the prevention and punishment of genocide, and there had been an international court and some small country like the Gambia decided to bring a case against Germany under the convention to do that. Can you imagine how marvelous that would have been? I can't prove it yet, but it does seem that the consequence of having in open court at the International Court of Justice these proceedings against Myanmar and a unanimous provisional measures order by the International Court of Justice that Myanmar must cease and desist and report every six months on its actions to cease and desist has apparently had the effect of reducing the horror. So there's some evidence, anecdotally, but of course we don't know. In short, even if they're not effective, I think the world is a better place for having a piece of paper which says, here are the things you're not allowed to do to human beings under any circumstances. And having a system of courts which allows those words written on a piece of paper to be taken into account. Right now, as you know, there are investigations in Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, Germany on these international crimes, and the International Criminal Court is focusing on what it's gonna do. The United States is completely hamstrung because it has this absurd policy that the ICC cannot exercise jurisdiction over any person who is a national of a state which is not a part of the ICC statute. That's to protect Americans from ever being investigated for crime. So if an American commits a genocide in Britain, although Britain's a party, an American can't be on the US theory, subject to the Defense Department's theory, subject to the jurisdiction of the court. It's absurd. It's, it's, it's also wrong. But that's the position. 
And lo and behold, along comes the good Senator Lindsey Graham with his draft resolution to say, we totally support the ICC investigation of Russians doing nasty things in Ukraine. Russia's like the US, it's not a part of the ICC statute. So like all of a sudden there's a bit of mayhem in Washington. Oops, what does this mean? And there's a big battle going on right now between the White House and the Defense Department about what they do about their policy. These are big and complex issues. That's why I said we're in this sort of, we're in 1472. It's gonna take a long time to work out all of these things. Just wait for the mic. Coming, I'm also a big fan of your work and your thinking. I'm, it seems like much of the environmental destruction today is the result of failures to act as well as affirmative acts, at least in my own country here. Um, and so I'm wondering to what extent the working group was interested in crafting a definition that could encompass omissions as well as acts and the extent to which uh, crimes one through four sort of limit our ability to think about omissions as crimes or whether there's sort of precedent for criminalizing, uh, holding individuals accountable for failures to act as well. We absolutely thought about that. And we make clear that the word act includes omissions. And in relation to what you're saying, there was one other aspect that was really important for us. We didn't want this to be a set of rules which only cut in when, the, when and after the harm has been done. What's the point of that? I mean, I'm a big proponent of precaution and acting. And so the definition refers to knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood. So at the point of decision making, if you take the wrong path, on this definition, it ought theoretically to be possible for a prosecutor at the ICC, assuming this is part of international law, to commence proceedings before the authorization begins to cut in and the harm is committed. I think in the environmental context, I mean in the human context too, but in the environmental context, you, you want to use the mechanisms to prevent harm. So both emissions, so emissions are covered and this is intended to prevent harm rather than simply punish for harm once it has occurred which would sort of be a pointless exercise when it comes to things like climate change. You, you want it to cut in to, to change consciousness and to change behavior and inform the political debate. I mean, coming also to the last question, I think part of the way these laws operate is they inform political debate, they inform public discourse, they inform public opinion. That's obviously why President Biden has done what he's done. I mean. When he described Putin as a war criminal, I thought that seemed like one of those Biden-esque, off-the-cuff, not fully thought through remarks. But in relation to genocide, I think that is part now of a strategy um, of upping the ante. And particularly in his second statement on Wednesday evening, he said, well, I think it looks to me like a genocide, but of course it will be for the lawyers before international courts to make that decision. And again, those words are very interesting. You know, the previous American president would not have been referring to international courts having a role in dealing with these kinds of issues. So, so language and words are very, very important. And, uh, and his words have a consequence in terms of public perception um, and what may happen. So, so they're significant. Professor Alfis. Thank you so much. This has been really interesting. I really enjoyed hearing about the mechanics of the working group also. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more stories to tell oh there. Yeah. I had two super complicated questions, or super big questions, I guess, that I wanted to ask very simply. The first one is about movement and the climate and an ecocide or, or, or destruction of environment. So I've heard you talk about the media and academia as playing a really cool key role in furthering this idea of ecocide. But one of, I think, is the most interesting and most hopeful aspects of the climate change debacle is the way it's galvanized young people and the movement 
um, indigenous movements, campesino movements, and other kinds of movements that are, take such a big role in, in calling to action. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about what role um, you think movements have, what movement support there is for the idea of ecocide. And the second question I had is about the limitations of criminal policy as a response to um, the destruction of the environment. And I heard you very clearly talk about criminal responsibility as focusing the mind, but people are fungible, and I'm sure there's lots of people who want to be CEO of Exxon, um, even facing some criminal exposure. Um, and I'm sure Exxon has become very sophisticated in changing its behavior to limit its exposure to criminal liability. I wanted you to talk about like putting people in prison as really as a, as, as a method of repair for economic, uh, um, environmental damage. Um, so yeah, I think those are the two questions I had. Thank you. So on the first question, I think the movement has been hugely significant. Hugely, hugely significant. And it is very largely much younger people who have been pushing for this. I mean, if you go on to social media and the Twitter sphere, you'll see there is astonishing range of support around the world for ideas like ecocide. And, and I felt it myself in, you know, a rather clear way. Um, I mean, I think that quite a lot of the work that I do is sort of interesting and generally well-intentioned and socially useful, not always, but quite often. And this is the only occasion in which my own three children expressed happiness, <laughs> that I was finally doing something useful. And I thought that was really interesting, really interesting. There was an article in the Guardian newspaper that this working group had been set up and it prompted a response. Um, and I thought that was reflective, actually, of what you're saying, is that for my generation, we feel, I think, a particular responsibility. We've really screwed things up for 30 years. I mean, it's a lot of people have tried. I've been very involved on climate change and stuff, but we failed. We have to accept we have failed. And so I think we feel uh, an acute responsibility and at this point, that brings you into the Lauterpacks and the Lemkins of the world, who I actually find really inspiring. And I think there is a parallel. You know, in 1945, these two individuals had learnt, or were about to learn, that their entire families had perished. It would be totally reasonable for them to curl up in a corner and weep, but they didn't. They picked themselves up, they dusted themselves off, and they put phenomenal amounts of time and energy, both dying very young, no doubt, because of the stresses and the strains of what they were doing and what they'd been doing. I think they too were motivated by other generations. Ellie Lauterpack, the son of Hirsch Lauterpack, told me that you know his his efforts it, as a young man and his interest in what his father did had a profound effect on what his father did. And I think, but for you know. Greta Thunbergs of the world and the vast and the advisors of the world and the social movements and social media, these ideas wouldn't, this idea of ecocide wouldn't get the traction that it is getting. I think your first question is much easier one to answer than your second one. Um, is putting people in prison? Uh, a useful and effective thing to do in getting them to change their behavior. Well, you know, I'm as conscious of anyone of the debates about that. And that does raise a fundamental question. What are the instrumentalities that are available to us to cause changes of behavior? 
we see that in relation to what's going on in Ukraine now. So what are the means available to try to get Mr. Putin to change his approach? None of them individually will have an impact. Diplomatic means fail. Economic sanctions fail. Military means, actually, interestingly, that's given him a bit of pause for thought. And he has failed in his objective to take over Kyiv, various other parts of Ukraine. That may cause him to double down in the east, and what happens in the east may be even worse because of that failure. Legal mechanisms and the invocation of the criminal law. There is now some anecdotal evidence coming out from Ukraine that for younger soldiers, the younger Russian soldiers, some of the concerns about sanctions, including criminal sanctions, undermined the sense of the legitimacy of what they were doing. So I wouldn't say they had a patent and real fear of immediately being locked up and sent to prison for what they were doing, but the sense of the decency and the rightness of what they were doing seems to have been influenced in part by the strengthening of the uh, resistance. And in that respect, you know, I've been very involved in this idea of a special criminal tribunal for the crime of aggression in Ukraine. Not because I think that locking up Mr. Putin or the fear of being locked up is going to change him an iota, but because I think that it goes to the battle of ideas issues and the legitimacy issues. And support has come from really strange places. So one of those places was the recently retired British equivalent to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who went on BBC and said, I support the idea for a special criminal tribunal for the crime of aggression for the following reason. You win a military conflict because of three things. Your weaponry, your strategy, and your morale. And morale really matters on the battlefield. And one of the things you do to strengthen the morale of one side and undermine morale on the other is use the instrumentalities of the law. And I think that's really what I'm saying about changing consciousness. The fellow who runs ExxonMobil has to go home and have dinner with his partner, maybe with his kids, and be given an earful about what he's doing. I think that is likely to have a bigger impact than the idea that he might one day do time or that doing time is actually going to influence him one way or the other in what he does. And I think what's underexplored in my world of international law, I know there is some work being done domestically in various parts of the world, is the power of rules and the law to influence human behavior in soft ways. I'd really like to know a lot more about that. Um, but there is some academic work on that issue um, of, of how you influence and inform human behavior by incorporating into legal instruments adopted at the international level um, what is acceptable and what is unacceptable behavior. So, so that's where I put the accent. And I recognize the force of your point. Um, you know, I'm generally not in favor of locking up large numbers of people. And I think that comes back to the question before. It's the preventive function. It's incorporating into rules at the international level certain sets of values in the hope, belief, expectation, desire that over time they'll they'll inform what is doable and what is not doable. That, that's how I would put it. But I think there's work to be done on, on whether that hope is has support. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Professor, for being here with us today. I wanted to first say that I think the concept of ecocide, as you've presented it, is brilliant. And so please forgive the cynicism yeah. embedded in the following two questions. <laughs> far away, um, far away. I, the, the first one has to do with the crime of aggression, which, as many of us know, took nearly 20 years to be 
activated um, for the jurisdiction of the court to be activated over the crime uh, and for which only 43 states are presently accepting the jurisdiction of the court. How do you imagine uh, states will respond to this, to the proposition of ecocide being uh, amended into the Rome Statute? Do you imagine it will take as long as the crime of aggression? Do you think states might be, especially states in the Global South, will be more amiable to its inclusion? Um, and my second question has to do with the capacity of the Office of the Prosecutor. As many of us who study international law here at Berkeley know, we're all, we often joke that the Office of the Prosecutor has a smaller budget than the Berkeley Police Department. And so, and uh, of course, as we also know, situations are often closed by the Office of the Prosecutor, not because there isn't a valid investigation, but because uh, they simply don't have the capacity. So how d would you respond to the critiques that you know the inclusion of this fifth crime would not be adequately taken up by the Office of the Prosecutor due to its capacity? So um, on your first question, I, I, I really don't know how states will will react and, and find it difficult to predict. Um, I think it turns on what the final formulation is. And we sort of debated this quite a lot in the working group because, you know, I am generally of the view in these kinds of things that the best is the enemy of the good, that less is more. You're doing something sort of revolutionary here. Um, you're trying to incorporate a new set of values into the international criminal legal order. And my sense is that you want to do it by getting a foothold, and then when you have the foothold, to expand it. So my way of doing it would be to have the most de minimis definition, which only gets the most egregious acts, to get it onto the statute books, and then over time, judges and prosecutors will chip away expand it, which is in a way sort of what's happening with genocide. I mean, Biden's intervention yesterday is sort of a way, you know, I got a call from the New York Times this afternoon saying, what did I think about the dilution of President Biden's, uh, uh, President Biden's effective dilute meaning of definition, which is a way of saying broadening the scope of its application. Dilution has a sort of pejorative type of frame, but that's how it's being perceived. So I think everything turns on the exact definition you put in and taking the sting out of the possible threat for most of the countries most of the time. So tactically, like Lemkin, I would aim for a definition that brings as many states comfort as possible in order to get it adopted. And I would not take a purist approach. The purist approach, on the other hand, to give it its credit, is what's the point of having such a definition on the statute book at all? And I think reasonable people can disagree, coming back to my last point, what actually changes human consciousness? I think that a minimal ecocide amendment to the ICC would begin the process of changing consciousness. And I would not tend to the view that it's better to have nothing than a bad definition of ecocide. But I think it will all turn on what states finally come up with, how many of them go, f go for it. Um, again, just on the time element, as you know, the reason that I've talked about 1472 and all of that is I know there's a strong desire to have things happen now and tomorrow, and but you've got to put this in its broader historical context. I mean, until 1945, a state was free in international law, I'm not talking about domestic law, but you know, if a state said, okay, everyone who happens to be sitting on the right-hand side of the room will be executed tomorrow at six o'clock, there was no rule of international law which said you couldn't do that. You could do it. International law didn't impose limits, and the revolution of 1945 was to say, actually, you can't do that under international law. There are limits on what states can do. And the reaction against that is strong. That is what Make America Great Again is about. That is what Brexit is about. Re removing those constraints, attacking the 1945 moment. So the battle that's going on right now, and it's going to be a big issue as to whether Ukraine 
undermines the 1945 moment or reinforces and strengthens it. I think that's a really interesting conversation to have. Um, in relation to the office of the prosecutor, I mean, let me just be very, very clear. I didn't say this earlier on. I am deeply depressed about the state of the International Criminal Court. If you leave this room and you go on to the, statue, the website of the International Criminal Court, as it sounds you probably have already done, you will see that I think it's about 30 or so people have been indicted for international crimes since the ICC was established. It became operational in 2002. Every single person who has been indicted is black and from Africa, okay? Black people and African people do not have a monopoly on international crime. Something has gone terribly wrong in the work of the International Criminal Court. And when it comes to indicting non-black, non-African people, the ICC has been absolutely useless. And it could have done it. The ICC has jurisdiction and has had jurisdiction since 2002 over Afghanistan. It has not opened an investigation in relation to crimes perpetrated in Afghanistan by British and American nationals, although it has the jurisdiction to do it. Why not? Well, we know why not. It's because it's politics that has prevented that from happening. So against that background, Ukraine comes along, and without wishing to be too cynical about it, you know, one of the reasons that it's seen like manna from heaven, a referral by 40 countries, is all of a sudden the prosecutor's going to be able to indict some white people. And it really needs to indict some white people because the legitimacy of the ICC in Africa is pretty low. Look at the resolutions adopted in the General Assembly in relation to Russia and Ukraine. In the first big resolution, the one in which 141 states voted in favor, of the African continent membership, half abstained. And in the second resolution, in relation to re the, re the suspension of Russia from the Human Rights Council, I think more than three quarters abstained and about 10 voted against. So there is a real issue on the delivery of international justice. And that's why it's vitally important in going forward with the crime of ecocide that it must be driven by countries of the global south. When I was first approached to do the chairmanship of the working group, they wanted just me to do it. Another white male from Europe chairing the group is totally unacceptable in 2020. And the group is incredibly balanced and the chairing of it was very balanced. And that just gives it an added heft. And the world has not been very good about taking into account the views of other countries. And we feel that right now in relation to Ukraine. You know, it's a big issue in Europe. It's a big issue in the United States. Is it a big issue in Africa and South America and parts of Asia? No, it's not. It's not. I mean, you, these Europeans, again, obsessed with their own sort of well-being. We've had terrible wars in Africa and other parts of the world, and no one wanted to create special criminal tribunals for aggression there, and no one you know, wanted to do this, that, and the other. And what about Iraq? Isn't Iraq illegal? Yes, Iraq was manifestly an illegal war. And the United States committed torture. And there has been no consequence. You at Berkeley know this better than anyone, okay? Nothing, nothing has happened. No accountability. And all of a sudden, the United States comes along and says, oh, you know, Putin's doing all these terrible things. We want to prosecute him. War crimes, torture, terrible things, genocide, crime of aggression, blah, blah, blah. Well, international law isn't just for others. And I think part of the discussion about all of this has to focus on how these things are perceived in other parts of the world. That's not a reason for not coming down like a ton of bricks on Putin and on Russia, the terrible things that are going on but international law must be a more level playing field. And the answer to your question, I think, will turn on the legitimacy of the definition that is adopted and the support for it across the world. If it's seen as a European thing, it won't go anywhere. So that is the challenge. That is the challenge. And, and that was why the group came up with a definition 
although it's been severely criticized in some quarters, which basically says that certain things can happen in the global south would not be an ecocide, but if the same thing happened in Britain or in France, it would be an ecocide. I, I, and that's complex, but I, I don't see any other way to do it. It, it. It's essentially a way, it comes back to this equity issue, it's essentially a way of using the criminal law to achieve an adjustment in the path forward, recognizing that different parts of the world have made a disproportionately large use of the natural resources in creating their systems of wealth. And we have to find a way to address that. So it's really complex, as you've come to understand. It's really not simple. Um, so I am sorry, but we are already 10 minutes over. Um, Professor Sands has kindly agreed to stay up and answer questions afterwards for a few minutes. So please invite you up to ask those questions. But we're going to conclude it now. And I just wanted to draw attention. Um, Philippe, you said, will Ukraine undermine or strengthen international law? And I think that interesting choice of that construction the ambiguity about what we mean by Ukraine, because of course Ukraine doesn't have the power by itself to do either of those things. It's going to be everyone's reaction to Ukraine and with Ukraine and about Ukraine that's going to answer that question. And thank you for giving us so much to think about for how we are going to be a part of that conversation. Thank you.